Thank you, Nancy. By the way, Nancy had a birthday Friday. Okay, her and uh, Jeanette, uh, Brother Jim's aunt, share the share a birthday. Jeanette turned ninety-four, and Nancy didn't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but happy birthday to Nancy, amen? Appreciate her playing the piano for us today. And continue to keep uh, little Micah and uh, Brett and Lisa in your prayers. And pray he'll keep progressing nicely. Just pray he'll continue to do so and be able to come home from hospital soon. All right? Luke 15 for our scripture tonight. Luke chapter 15. We are going to read verses 11 through 24. For our scripture reading, verses 11 through 24, and I'll begin on verse 11, then you join me on 12, then I'll read 13, we'll alternate like that, until we end together on verse 24 of Luke chapter 15, all right? As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture, all of us standing to read God's word, and verse 11, and he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, father, Give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger." I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, and had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck, and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat, and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. And let's pray together. If someone would give me a cold water, that'd be a blessing. Thank you. Father, we bow before you in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the wonderful time we've had already together here this evening, for the wonderful songs we enjoy singing, and Lord, for the wonderful testimony and uh, the, the witness here that Brother D'Angelo has given to us. Uh, thank you, Lord, for what you are doing uh, in our midst and in his life. And, Lord, we're asking you to meet with us now as we open up your word. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your words. We don't believe it's the words of men or the words of a man. We believe it to be the words of God. And I pray you would help us to glean tonight from this passage in Luke 15 what you would have us to learn. So open our understanding and give us all ears to hear what you would say to your church this evening. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. All right, you may be seated. See. We have spoke about the lost sheep and the shepherd representing Jesus uh, looking for the sheep for salvation. We talked last week about the lost coin and the woman representing God the Holy Spirit looking for that lost coin for service, for usefulness. 
And now we come to the third part of the parable, which, which with a father representing God the Father, uh, and the son with whom he desires to have fellowship. And we're going to glean some things here uh, from this parable, this part of the parable tonight. Notice verse 11, a certain man had two sons. Right away, when you just have that short little verse, it says a lot. I think right away you understand that this story is going to have something to do with relationships. It's going to have something to do with the relationship between a father and his two sons. And indeed, that's what takes place. Uh, then you find out, two sons, there's an older brother and there's a younger brother. And that's another relationship that, that will be looked at as we look into the parable. Uh, there's a contrast between the older brother and the younger brother. There's a difference between the two. Uh, we know that they're going to each make choices. And there's going to be choices made that the younger brother makes and the older brother makes. And the story is going to examine those choices. And of course, when, when this is called sometimes the prodigal son, the word prodigal means wasteful. Because he took the inheritance and he wasted it. Okay, that's why he's called the prodigal son. But let's glean some uh, principles. Let's glean some truths from this passage here this evening. Number one, I want you to notice the selfishness of the son. The selfishness of the son. Notice verse 12. The younger of them said to his father, Father, what's the next two words, church? What are they? Give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And then the father divided unto him his living. Give me. In fact, I come to understand that probably most of this young man's life, if not all of his life, was all about me. Uh, all about what I want. All about what I want to do. And uh, imagine, imagine how you'd feel if you were a father. And how many fathers in the room tonight? I see your hand. Quite a few. How'd you feel if your son sat down with you and said something like this? Well, Dad, you've done pretty well for yourself over the years. You worked hard, you saved your money, you invested wisely, and in addition to the house and maybe the land you have, uh, I know you've got some stocks and bonds, and I know you've got an IRA, and you've kind of got uh, some cash value in the life insurance, and uh, I think you've done pretty well. I, I, think, I think you're worth maybe, uh, oh, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000, and uh, I, I want my inheritance now. I want you to do whatever you've got to do to liquidate some things, so that uh, I'm not waiting until you die. I, I want my money now. I watched that commercial from J.D. Wentworth, and I want my money, and I want it now. And you, you wouldn't... I wonder, I wonder how you'd feel if you were dad. Think about that. In other words, it, it's, it's saying, I really don't care about you. I really don't care about your life. All I want is your stuff. All I want is the money. All I want is the, the things that... I, I value what you can give me more than I value you. That's what the son was saying. He loved his dad's money more than he loved his dad. His father was just a checkbook to him, a bank account, a list of assets. I just want to get as much out of dad as I can, is all he was thinking about. Give me. He didn't care much for father's love and for his fellowship because it doesn't have any cash value. Pride. It's all about him. Everything he looked at in his life, that he saw around his home and in his dad and in his brother and anyone else, he looked at it through the lenses of how does this affect me? What's in it for me? He didn't care about others. He didn't care about his dad. He didn't care about his brother. He didn't care about the, the farm. He didn't care about anything. He just cared about himself. Very self-centered. Very proud. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. The truth of the matter is, if we're not careful, we get caught up in that as well. And we begin to look at things in life all by how it affects us. And yet Ephesians tells us we're to live our lives for the praise of His glory. We're to live our lives to bring glory to God. In fact, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether therefore we eat or drink or whatsoever you do, 
Do all to the glory of God. Do all of it to make God look good. And how often do we do things to make sure that we look good? Because it's about us instead of being about God. And as soon as something bad happens or something that we think is bad or we don't like, God, why are you doing this to me for? We get so selfish because it's not about God. It's about us. I wonder how many of us are, uh, we, we go after God for what we get out of God instead of God Himself. When God desires fellowship and we just desire what God will give to us. He was selfish. The son just wanted what he wanted. Number two, the son wanted now what he should have had later. He wanted now what he should have had later. The inheritance was supposed to be after the father passed away. Now, the inheritance was already defined by statute, by law. The oldest son would get two-thirds of the estate, and the younger son would get one-third. That was all spelled out. You didn't, get to, you didn't write a will up like we do and decide who's your favorite, you know, or who you wanted the most of it to go to. You didn't, it was already established this is how it would work. So he knew that he had a percentage of the wealth coming to him eventually. And yet he didn't have any right to demand it prior to his father passing. But that's what he was demanding. He didn't have any patience. Have you ever noticed that when you get selfish and you begin to, to, to think only about yourself, you become very impatient, hard to wait? And boy, have we lost the ability to wait. You know, it's, we don't want to wait in line for anything if we can help it. If there's a, how many have had the experience of being in some kind of a traffic jam on the freeway and it seems like that if you're in the right lane, the left lane's the one that's moving. And so you decide, I'm going to get over in that left lane and get going. And as soon as you get over there, what happens? It isn't just me that happens to, huh? huh? No. And why do we do that? I don't want to wait. I don't want to wait. I think it was Brother Taylor that was sharing the other day about uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 where you're familiar with it. It says in verse number 1 that everything there's a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. To everything there's a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. Would you understand there's a, there's a time for everything. Not only, not only do we want what is right, we want it when it's right to have it. It's not, you know, it's, it's the way to get something is to save your money and buy it. That's how America used to operate. America's being destroyed on credit. Our Congress is destroying our country on credit. 19 trillion or 20 trillion dollars in debt. You can't even imagine that. Wait until you're married to have sexual relations. The proper order is marriage and then children. That's biblical. We've kind of turned that around. Wait and earn your money and save your money don't try to gamble to get the money. I'm amazed at the, the people I watch who go in and buy stacks of cards. That I watch them go outside of the convenience store there and they sit in their car scratching away. And if they win, they go in and get the money and buy more cards. Then they lose the money they got. Wait, wait. You know, wait for God to give you what you need in His time. In His time. God not only knows what we need, He knows when we need it. One thing you learn when, when, 
you learn that God doesn't, we are, we are all about time. How much time do I have to do this? What time do I got to be at work? What time do I get out of work? What time is dinner? What time do I go to bed? What time do I get up? What time do you want to meet? What time are we eating? What time is church? Time, 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 time. Everything we do is something about what time. Do you understand? God doesn't operate in the realm of time. That's hard for our, it's hard for us to fathom that. It really is. But God doesn't operate in the realm of time. That's why he said, I am. I am sent him to you. Not, not I, I was or I will, I am. He's in the present. He's always in the present. He didn't say, I was the God of Abraham and the God of Jacob. He said, I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Jacob. I am the God of Isaac. It's all present tense to God. Selfishness always wants now what you should wait for to come. Can I help you with this too, mom and dad? Quit, quit letting your four-year-olds and five-year-olds and six-year-olds be 11 and 12 and 13-year-olds when they're too young to do that. You, I, I, we're, 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 we're making our kids grow up way too fast. Let them be kids. I, I'm, I'm not opposed. I, I, love, I like sports, grew up playing sports, but you know, we didn't start... You know, we didn't start any organized sports till eight years old and, and, and really didn't start playing some of the little leagues till ten years old. So what did you do then? We picked up and played in the vacant lot down the street. Now to know what it is to go around and get the guys and find a, find a, a, a front yard or a backyard or somewhere or open field and, and play pickup football game. Kids don't know how to do that anymore. Everything is, everything's so organized and everything, you know, you got, you got kids out there five years old and four years old trying to play trying to play baseball and they don't know what's going on. I got some six year olds out there. I went to see a, my grandson on a team, you know, and they've got all these kids around the infield and they put the ball on a tee and the, you know the kid hits it and little Johnny's out there. You know. He's looking at the sky and watching the birds and well why? That's what six year olds do. That's why. Get the ball, get the ball. And then the kid runs to first, you know, and you got to tell him where first base is. And it's like, oh, drives me crazy. Don't, don't, don't rush ahead. Don't do that. Number three, the son didn't want any rules. The son didn't want any rules. So how do you know that, Pastor? Well, I'm kind of gathering that. From when he gathered all together in verse 13, he took his journey and he went into, notice, a far country. And then he wasted his substance with what? Riotous living. He, first of all, he, he wanted to get as far away from home as he could. He wanted to get as far away as he could. So he could do whatever he wanted to do. He wanted to surround himself with he wanted to surround himself with the people his mom and dad would never let him be around when he was home. That's the people I want to hang around with. Riotous living. Party animals. Immorality. Harlots, if you will. And he's just going to have a, the time of his life. I want to do all those things that my parents would never let me do. I'm going to have a fun. I'm going to live it up. I'm going to, I'm going to enjoy all these things the world says it, it can offer. You found out there's a high price to pay for low living. He's going to find it out the hard way. He thought, I don't want any rules. I don't want these boundaries. I, 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 would need to, I, I know what I'm doing. I, I know what I, I can handle this. Give me the money and let me go. I'm ready to make my own decisions. Let me, let me testify to you just briefly. Some of you know this. I don't know. Maybe all of you know it. 
When I was in junior high, my parents divorced. I was a seventh grader. And at that time, all of us kids went to live with my mother. My father didn't live far away. In fact, well, I'm trying to think it. I could walk there, probably from here to Frisch's. I could walk to my dad's house. But my mom had no rules. I was seventh grade. I was 12 years old. And I could stay out as late as I wanted. I could go anywhere I wanted. I never had to say where I was going, what I was doing. I could just go. I, I had old, my brother two years older than I. I had two older sisters. There were times they didn't even come home. Nobody said a word. You know, one night, I remember sitting out down, down the road. from my, and I got done at a friend's house at a party. And I was just walking out there by, beside the school. I remember it. It was, it was after midnight, or right around midnight, and I got to thinking something, Brother Don. I got to thinking, nobody knows where I am, and nobody cares. Nobody cares where I am right now. It doesn't matter if I go home or don't go home. You know what? You know what? I didn't like it. I, I, had to, I got to thinking, you know, I, I have a life here that, that a lot of kids say they wish they had. Oh, man, I wish I had parents you. Did you do anything you want? No, you don't. Did you realize that nobody cares about me? You know what, you know what happens, kids, when your mom and dad say, you're going to be home at this time? Or who are you going with? Who's going to be there? You going anywhere else besides there? Hmm? Gonna, and they ask you all those questions. You know why they do that? Because somebody cares about you. They care about what happens to you. They're trying to tell you that they love you. I was the first child who voluntarily, I left my mom and I went and lived with my dad. Why did I live with my dad? Because my dad said, where are you going? No, you're not going to go there. Oh, you're going to go over here? You go to Brad's house? Okay. Uh, you go there, you'll be home at this time. And you know what? I liked it. Somebody cared about me. He thought, he thought he didn't want any rules. You know what you found out? You know what he found out? That when he got outside the boundaries that dad laid down for him, it was only bondage. Only things that put him in bondage. People think, I don't want those rules. Or I don't like that church. They tell you how to live. They tell you what to do. They put these boundaries on you. No, those boundaries because we love you. Those boundaries are because God loves us. And it's not that uh, we're, we're going to, listen, there's things out there that can hurt us. Years ago, um, when we lived out west in Arizona, we had a little, little dog. Uh, I don't even know what, you know what I'm talking about? Over on uh, Maryland Avenue and, and behind us lived the, uh, somebody with two pit bulls. And our little puppy, I mean, that puppy wasn't even bigger than, than, than the Bible, I don't think. I mean, not, not much bigger than that. And it would always... <laughs> Barking at those pit bulls back there. We would say, you don't want to go back there. You know what he's saying? I want my freedom. Rawr, 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 rawr. Don't put me in boundaries. Rawr, rawr, rawr. Let me out. I want my freedom. Rawr, rawr, rawr. You have to understand dogs to get that. <laughs> understand? One of them talking dogs, you know. One day we heard the commotion and he had finally dug under that fence enough to get through. And we went out there and looked over that fence and they were throwing that dog around like it was a rag doll. And got the attention of the people who lived there. They came out and got him. And I mean, he was just, just barely hanging on in shock, really. So he learned, he'd, and, and he lived, by the way, but he learned a valuable lesson. Didn't he? Hmm? Learned the hard way. And he said, you know what? I think I like it inside my fence. <laughs> Why? There's things out there that can hurt me bad. There's fact, there's things out there that could kill me. And my owners, they don't put me in this fence because they don't like me. Or they're trying to keep me from having any fun. They have me in this fence because they love me. And they're trying to protect me from things that can hurt me. 
Listen to me, children. When your parents put up the boundaries and they put up the fences, thank God for that. You have somebody who loves you. And somebody wants to keep you from things that could destroy you. So the son just didn't want any rules or regulations in his life. Number four, the son only had fun for a season. Oh, he lived it up for a while. The Bible says he wasted his substance with riotous living. I'm sure he had a good time as long as the money lasted. But not only did the money not last, but the economy went bad. First of all, he spent all. He spent it all. He had no, no discipline at all. Didn't know how to handle his money. Thought he could, but he, but he spent everything. Life was just one big party. He was eating and drinking and having merry. And first his money ran out. And then guess what? All his friends ran out too. All of a sudden, nobody was around. Because he didn't have any money. You know, the great thing about not having money is you know who your friends are. When, when, when you have a lot of money, you don't know if your friends like your money or they like you. But when, you're, when you don't have anything, you know they must like you for you. And he ended up with nobody. And the economy went south and it was a bad, bad time. The gravy train ran out of gravy. So he had to look for a job. He had to go to work. And he joined himself to the citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. I kind of laughed because, boy, is that tough on a Jewish boy. He's going to go in and take care of the, the pigs. The ultimate degradation, the ultimate humiliation. The pigs were unclean animals. We're not to have anything to do with them. Not to have any contact with them. Not even be around them. They were detestable. But not only that, he was not only with the pigs and, and uh, the, the waiter in the swine restaurant, so to speak, but boy, I tell you what he said. He, it got to where he almost was ready to get down on his hands and knees and stick his face in the trough and eat with the pigs. Their food was looking good because he was that hungry. How different this was than what he imagined it would be like when he left his father's house. He never, he never thought it'd be like that. He thought it'd just be fun all the time. He never saw himself at the pig trough. Where was his freedom now? Where was his independence now? But it was through that, when it says he would have filled his belly with the husk the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. Verse 17, when he came to himself. God used that to bring him to himself. And that's our next point, is that God uses difficult times to draw us back to him. God will let you go to the bottom so you have nowhere to look but up. And you'll have to look to Him. And He finally came to Himself. He finally realized, man, I'm in bad shape. This isn't, this isn't what I pictured it to be. And He finally comes to Himself. And you know what I think He realized? I've been stupid. I've been wrong. This isn't good. He didn't gloss over it. He didn't sugarcoat it. He didn't try to make it sound better. He said, how many hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I'm perishing with hunger. I don't talk about my brother. I'm talking about the guys who work for my dad, the servants. They've got it better than I do. Wow. Several things. He admitted he's in bad shape. He recognized the cause of his problem. His own sin. He didn't blame dad, he didn't blame brother, he didn't blame the economy, he didn't blame his friends. He got out the mirror and he looked at it and he said, I see the problem. It's me. Three, he acknowledged that he, he didn't have any claim on his father anymore. He said, I'll arise and go to my father and I'll say to him, I've sinned against heaven and before thee. 
I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. He said, I don't have any claim on you as a father. I don't even need to be called your son. Just make me as one of your hired servants. He was just seeking grace. Justice would keep him right where he was. But grace would bring him home. Undeserved favor would bring him home. And by the way, what a change in attitude, isn't there? You remember, remember the two words he used in verse 12? Was give me. And now he says, Father, make me. As one of those higher men. Now make me. That's a whole different attitude, isn't it? Whole different approach. And that's just what you have to do when you get away from God. Just have to do when you go to the far country and you get as far away from, from God and the people of God and the things of God as you can and you get involved in things that you know you shouldn't be involved in and you just think, I don't need those rules, I don't need those regulations, I know what I'm doing. And before you know it, you're sticking your head in the pig trough saying, what am I doing here? How did I get to this mess? You need to repent. Acknowledge your sin. And come back to God. Ask His forgiveness. Ask Him to be merciful to you. And the good news is, when you do that, God certainly will forgive you. God certainly will be looking to welcome you back. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's an amazing, amazing verse. You know, don't don't think of God as kind of remote and inaccessible. Don't think of God as one of those guys on Mount Rushmore. Stone-faced, cold. That's not who God is. He's majestic and He's awesome and He's unchanging. But he's forgiving, and he's loving, and he's merciful. He pities us as his children. When we repent, he's overjoyed. Every time with the sheep, with the coin, and then with the son, when they come back, when they find, when they're found, when they're covered, there's rejoicing. God rejoices when one sinner repents. And He rejoices just as much when a prodigal son comes back as He did when a lost one was saved. If you don't repent, you stay in the pig, in the pig, pig pen. You stay with the hogs. And you'll never know the love of the Father. Well, when the son repented, he decided, I better go home. He went home to his father. It's interesting, isn't it, when he said that? He said, I will arise, verse 18, and go. He didn't say, I'll arise and go home. He said, I'll arise and go to my father. He wasn't going back to a place. He was going back to a person. Sometimes I hear people say, well, when you backslide or you get away from God, you know, you go back to where that place you were. You know where you lost it. You know where you went away. You go back to that place. No, 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 no. Go back to a person. You get back with God. You need to get back with Him. That's where you went to stay. He wasn't coming back to a place or a routine or a way of life. He's coming back to His Father. He didn't say, I'll arise and reform. He didn't say, I'll arise and do better. He didn't say, I'll arise and join the church. He didn't say, I'll arise and I'll go to work. He said, I'll arise and I'll go to my Father. Don't just settle. When you've been away from God, when you've been out in the far country, don't you settle for I'll do better. Don't you settle for I'll go back to church. Don't you settle for all, I'll get around the right people. Don't you settle for anything less than I'll go back.
to my Father. I'm going to go back to God. I want to be close to Him. I want my relationship with Him. That's what you're missing. That's what He desires. I'm going to go to God and never stop. Put it, it puts it into effect. He arose, verse 20, and he came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Wow. Eager to restore him. Sometimes people think when you get away from God and some of you have been in that position and boy, you think it's just a long way back. And Satan would have you think, oh, it's so far. You, you, you got so much to make up. You got so much ground to cover. But I got news for you. You just start taking that first step and God is coming running to meet you. And he covers a whole lot more ground than you did. Brother Taylor you got right with God in 2002, 2001. I remember you telling the story of going into church on that Sunday night. If I remember right, I mean, you, you hardly could wait for the pastor to get done preaching. And in fact, it, it, and by the way, that shows you it's the work of the Spirit of God. He probably couldn't tell you what the pastor preached on. God was just dealing with his heart. He just wanted that pastor to, would you just end it so I could get to the altar? And buddy, he piled out of that, that, that seat and he was at the altar. And boy, it didn't take long, did it, to get from your seat to the altar. Huh? God meets you. It's never as far away as what you think it is. Do you want, do you want God? Or you just want His stuff? You want a relationship with Him? Or you just want what you can get out of Him? The younger son thought he was missing out on missing out on life because he stayed with dad. He thought he wanted to see what life was all about by leaving home, leaving his father. Would you understand this? It, it's so I, I see it, and 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 I've seen it with with good kids who grow up in a Christian home. There are people in this room who did not grow up in a Christian home. And some, some who have been out and they know what the world offers. They've been on the dark side of things. And now they're living for Christ and they'll tell you, man, that, that, that world doesn't have anything to offer. That's pain and that's sorrow and oh yeah, it looks like pleasure and looks like fun for a season, but I tell you, they don't show you the underside of that. They don't show you the pain and they don't show you the heartache and they don't show you the sorrow and they don't show the emptiness. They don't show you the loneliness. They leave all that part out. And you say, don't go there. And yet our Christian kids who have only known church and only known the things of God, they say, oh man, that's, that's what I want to do. I want to go out at the lights and I want to go out and have the good time and I want to go out and be with them. I don't want a curfew and I don't want people telling me who I can be with, who I can't be with. And you don't understand. Say, so how can you want that? Jesus said, I've come to have life, then you might have it more abundantly. Don't miss out on the best life there is. Hey, it's wonderful to be a Christian. It's wonderful to be a child of God. It's wonderful to be kept from the world. I don't want to, I don't belong. I don't belong in this world. I belong to another world, amen? He thought indulging in his desires and his freedoms would, would bring him freedom, but it only brought him to slavery. I talked Friday night to the RU group about Paul's desire and his passion to know God. What's your desire tonight? What's your passion? Do you want to know God? So many, so many believers are content to know about God. 
You're content to know about God when you come to church and, yeah, preacher, preach to me, tell me about God, but then you go home and your Bible lays all week. And you don't read it. You don't open that book up each day and say, God, show me who you are. Let me get to know you. You're just interested in knowing about God. Do you want to experience fellowship with Him? Do you want to know Christ? Are you a Christian because you want the things or expect to receive things from God? Well, uh, you know, I, they told me if I got saved, I'd have a happy marriage and I'd have a, a material prosperity and I'd have good health and nice friends and a pleasant life and, uh, you know, I'd just... Everything will be great. I read that book and said, I can have my best life now. I thought that was, that was what it was all about. No, 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 no. You may get those things. You may get some of those things. But it's not about things. It's about your relationship with God. It's about knowing Him. A lot of people who say they want God don't want God at all. They just want the things of God. Paul said, and I've read this Friday night, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them but dung that I may win Christ. When you read that passage in Philippians, he lists all the things that he would boast about. All the things that before Christ, he would have put in the asset column and said, look at what I've got. And most of the people of the world would have looked at him and said, that's impressive. He's really somebody. But once he came to know Christ, he said all those things of being a Pharisee and in the law blameless and the tribe of Benjamin and the stock of Israel and a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He said, you know what? <laughs> that all goes in the debit. In fact, it's not just a loss. He says, I count it as dung. You know what dung is. As I said Friday night, listen, nobody likes to be around dung. Ladies, you don't go to the, any any perfume counter and say, yes, I'd like something along the lines of cow manure. You don't do that. I really would like something that really reeks. Huh? No, you don't do that. We like to distance ourselves from that, do we not? Are you seeking God? Are you seeking a relationship with Him? Or are you like a prodigal? you distant. And you just want from God what you can get from God. And if God doesn't give you what you want, I'm done. Do you give any thought of how you can grow spiritually? Do you give any thought about time in God's Word or time in prayer, talking to the Lord? Are you in the distant country? Distant because you want His gifts, you want what He gives you, but you really don't want Him. You'd rather stay at a distance. Are you the prodigal? Giving God lip service, but keeping Him at a, difference, at a distance? Seeking His benefits, but not wanting a relationship? The good news is, you can repent. The good news is, if you take a step back towards God, he comes to meet you. He knows your heart. Come to yourself. Come to yourself. Realize what you're missing. Confess your sin. Turn to God. And He'll come running and take you in His arms. And that's where you want to be. You want to be. That's the prodigal who came home. We could take time and we won't take time tonight. There's, there's really another prodigal here who was at home, and that was the older brother. He was home, but he too huh, wasn't in the right relationship with his father. And that's another story. Well, maybe, maybe we'll have to do that another Sunday night and talk about the older brother. But this is the prodigal.
hey, are you a prodigal tonight? Hmm? Will you come back home? Will you come to the Father and let him receive you? I pray you will. Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for putting this parable in the Scripture. It has encouraged us. It has helped us. It has it has helped many prodigals through the years to come back home, to come back to the Father. Thank you, Lord, for your heart. Thank you for the great love that you have to us, the great desire to have a relationship with us. I'm fearful, Lord, that many of us are often guilty of only wanting something from you and not just wanting you. And I pray you'd help us, forgive us, cleanse us, give us a passion for you. We just want to be with you. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. I wonder tonight how many would say, Pastor, I'm the prodigal. I'm the one who's away from God. I need to come back to my father tonight. He's spoken to my heart. I'm ready to return. Would you slip your hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me tonight. That's me. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Amen. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have our invitation. God has spoken to your heart. Come on back. It starts right at the altar. On your face before God. Asking Him to forgive you. He'll receive you again. He'll kill the fatted calf. They'll be rejoicing. And there's rejoicing in your heart. Because there's no happier place to be than in fellowship with God. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to hearts tonight. I pray your will will be done in each heart and life. And I pray, Lord, that these who are coming back tonight to you, Lord, you would give them the joy of forgiveness, the joy of being loved by their Heavenly Father, the peace that passes all understanding. And Lord, help those in this room tonight who are not there, but they know someone who is. They know a prodigal. May they encourage them with some of the truths we've gone over tonight. And Lord, I pray you'd use it in the lives of others who are away from you this evening. Have your way in this invitation now in every heart and life, and I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays the invitation hymn, God has spoken to your heart. Please respond to him tonight, would you please? That's right. That's right. It's not as far as you think it is. Just take the step. Take a step. God will do the rest.
All right. Look this way for a minute, if you would. Are we done? Live stream? Why don't you go ahead and sign off, do whatever you do there. Take care of that. All right.